Hi, my name's Kyle Gold. I'm an author in the furry fandom. I've been writing since about uh, 2000. I've been writing novels since about 2005. Uh, a few of them are on the table there behind me. And I'm currently at Furry Weekend Atlanta, enjoying myself in my first trip to an East Coast convention in, uh, well, many, many years. When did you first start writing? Writing overall? Uh, wow. Long time ago. In college, I wrote some short stories for a science fiction magazine. Kind of lost track of it for a little while, and then um, picked it up again. Probably mid-90s, I started writing more furry stories, and then around 2000 was when I started writing some of the more adult stuff that I chose a pen name for. So did you discover furry through the sci-fi? I actually discovered furry through uh, cartoons on television. Uh, around the time Tiny Toons and Animaniacs were out, they were also very popular with people who were getting into the furry fandom. And I liked the cartoon shows, and I got into the furry fandom that way. Can you tell us about writing your first novel for the fandom? Sure. I had written a short story called The Prisoner's Release, which was published in Heat, Volumes 1 and 2, from Sofowolf Press. And when I wrote that, it occurred to me that there was a long story that happened before that short story, and I decided that I wanted to try to tell that story. I had made a few attempts at writing novels in the past. Most writers will tell you that their first novel is not really their first novel. Their first novel is a pile of paper in a bedroom drawer somewhere that never should see the light of day, and I have certainly two or three of those. But I thought, in this case, the characters were appealing enough and real enough to me that I could tell their story in a long form. And Vol was sort of the experiment that became that first novel. It was, in a lot of ways, it felt like kind of a safe experiment because I was writing it as an adult work. And so I wasn't sure what the balance would be as far as how it would appeal to people. But I thought maybe it will have some more appeal, like I'll hook people in with the adult content and then keep them with the story. And it turned out to be uh, quite an experience. It took me about, um, I want to say like nine months to write the first draft of it. Um, and I spent another year editing it, whittling it down. I still didn't really know a whole lot about what I was doing, but at least it came out in a form that I'm still pretty happy with. And so full of press liked it enough that they thought it was worth taking a chance on. So that was quite exciting. You mentioned then about kind of having the adult material to work on. Um, have, you, have you changed that since if you felt that like, you, know, you don't have to worry about that as much? You can rely on the story more. I, I do feel more confident in that. Actually, the current project that I'm working on, which has not been released yet, is a novel without any adult content and um, also with humans in it, which is another departure for me. I have not written a story with humans before. So it has humans and furries and no adult content, and people are a little bit troubled by that, but you know, it's hope it's got the same stories that I enjoy writing, so I'm sure people will still like it. But I do have that confidence in it. Having not written humans before, what's the appeal of writing um, an anthropomorphic character? Um, there's a couple of things that appeal about it. Um, first of all, there's the aesthetic of it, which as a furry fan, people are attracted to that concept of the characters with the ears, the muzzle, the tails, the fur, um, some of the animal characteristics. And from a literary sense, there's an appeal to it because the animals map pretty well to character archetypes. So you have a fox, which is not as physically imposing, but is more clever and relies on his wits. And then you have like big predators like a tiger or a bear who would be more physically imposing and are not characterized as being quite as clever. Um, so the, the neat things you can do is that the archetypes that you use in the stories, you can play against them. So you can have kind of a slow-witted fox or you can have a smart tiger or a tiger who's not as strong and figure out how that um, that causes conflict between characters and the species types. 
um, you also, what you also do is you kind of move to the side the cultural backgrounds and cultural baggage that come with using humans. Um, so the story that I'm writing now with humans, there's people that are Irish and people that are British and people that are American, and these people all have cultures that I have to be aware of and research and be you know, somewhat true to, and they're, oh, the, a person with this Irish background would not have these sympathies and all that. The using anthropomorphic animals in a context of their own allows me to just focus on who the character is and create whatever cultural background is needed from those species and those characters. So it's, it's kind of liberating in a sense. How long does the typical novel writing process last for you now? Um, beginning to end, about a year, a little more than a year. Uh, it now takes me about four to five months to get through a first draft. I usually let it sit for a month and then go back and I do an edit pass of my own on it. I pass it along to uh, a writing group. I have three or four people that I, I trust to give good critique and uh, be able to tell me where the flaws are in a novel. Um, they usually take about a month to read it and get back to me, and then I've got another month or two to do final edits, proofreading, um, everything else before it has to go to the publisher. And then the publisher has about a two to three month window from the time I give them the final manuscript. They have to do layout, um, proof in with the printer, and then they can finally get it released. What for you is most important when you, when you, when you publish in terms of the feedback you get? Oh, there, there are a few things that I, I've said have been really important to me. Uh, one of them is I just want people to start reading. Uh, I grew up loving books, and I feel like people are really missing out by not picking up more books these days. And so I, I occasionally will get letters from people saying, I haven't read anything that wasn't prescribed by my school in 10 years, but I picked up your book and loved it. And I always tell those people, that's a good start, great, go read something else. There's a ton of great stuff out there. Um, the furry fandom is starting to produce um, a, an amazing amount of creative creativity in art and prose and everything. Um, this year, there are six nominees for the Furry Fandom's Ursa Major Award for Best Novel, and all six of them are fandom generated. I believe, and I haven't gone back to check, but I believe that is the first time in the history of the Ursa Majors that there has not been an outside publisher's novel nominated. And I think that's just a great indication of how much the fandom has come to embrace writing, and, you know, we still have a ways to go. We still want the quality to be such that you know, these could be picked up by bookstores and that people would enjoy the story even if they don't like furries. But it's a great start and I'm just, I'm so proud of the community. Um, the, and it's, I guess it's, the, mo the thing that's most important to me is that people enjoy the books, enjoy the stories, keep wanting more and that they appreciate the medium of writing as well. Would you ever attempt to try and write something that could be mass published? Um, I would. I, I've sent some stories, some short stories this year to uh, adult fiction collections outside the fandom. Uh, there was a collection from Circlet Press that has one of my stories in it. It was stories of shape changers. And so I wrote a human and a were creature in that uh, story. Uh, I also sent a story to a traditional romance press that was calling for football oriented stories. And I have this novel series uh, out of position and isolation play and so I wrote a story in that world with furries and they accepted it and printed it alongside all of their you know locker room stories of the football team captain and the shy math nerd who secretly desires him and you know and it's in there and so I haven't gotten much feedback from anyone who picked up the book expecting the locker room story and got a coyote and a mule deer having sex in a closet but you know, we'll see. It'll be interesting. It's, I think it's getting out there, and I think the more furries exposed in things like CSI and things like uh, the news articles and the various conventions, I think it is slowly moving from something where people go, that's freaky, and I don't want to hear anything about it. We've moved to, oh, that's kind of amusing. And the kids that, have, that are growing up that have grown up 
knowing about this. Now um, we go by them in uh, at comic conventions, and they just kind of walk past the booth and they're like, "Oh, furries, yeah, whatever." And I think that bodes well. I mean, it's getting to the point where people will start to say, they'll move from the, oh, that's kind of weird, to, oh, that's kind of weird, and they have interesting stuff that I'm, that appeals to me. I think, I mean, furry, I've said this before, furry is one of the most creative fandoms I've ever seen or been associated with. Um, there's a lot of niche fandoms out there. There's, uh, you know, Doctor Who, Star Trek, Star Wars, and many others. And all of these have their own source material. And people write fan fiction, they do cosplay, they do artwork, they do all this stuff. But because Furry doesn't have a central source that we're all drawn from, we are forced to create our own source material. And I think that has inspired a huge amount of creativity. There's just so many diverse aspects to the fandom now. There's fantasy writing and contemporary writing and science fiction and horror. There's cartoony artwork and hyper cartoony artwork and anime artwork and realistic artwork and there's costumes of all shapes and sizes and colors and um, people have started to go away from traditional species now making their characters sort of generic wolf or fox or canid with neon green and purple and whatnot and it's just people are seeing so much freedom in expression that I think this has uh, it's really, it's one of the things that I love about the fandom, and I love to see it evolve and, and grow over the years. And where do people find your work? Um, most of my work is linked off uh, kylegold.com, K-Y-E-L-L gold.com. Um, it's for sale online at Sofa Wolf Press and uh, Fur Planet, and we're at most of the big conventions. Thanks. And thank you for your time. <laughs>